on this episode of China Unscripted. China is trying to kick the U.S. out of Asia. Unfortunately, the U.S. is wearing a giant kick me sign. And that could mean China's military will dominate the region. And your mom. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly Chong. And I'm Matt Ganeshda. And joining us today, once again, is Grant Newsham. Newsham is a retired U.S. Marine colonel. He's now a research fellow at the Center for Security Policy. Thanks for joining us again, Grant. No pleasure to be here. So China wants to become the global hegemon of Asia. But to do that, they need to undermine American influence in the region. What's their strategy for that? Hmm. Well, it's a a multifaceted strategy. I think it uh, one is to be just about everywhere in the region you can possibly imagine. It's sort of like uh, going to a horse race and betting on every single horse in every single race. So you will find a Chinese presence almost anywhere. Uh, But the the way it manifests itself is generally uh, the following sequence. It starts with commercial inroads. You will get uh, Chinese people there doing business uh, in in a country. And they will then um, drive out any local business and they will come to dominate the really commercial activity down to the street corner level. Uh, But also you will have bigger uh, Chinese investments in things like fishing, uh, forestry, mining, uh, logging, uh, that sort of thing. And it starts commercially and commercial influence uh, and is financial influence, which is political influence. So China also works in diplomats. They are very good about sending diplomats all over the place. So they will have a diplomatic presence, a commercial presence. And as I said, this all creates influence. If they, you carefully apply it, and they apply it not just carefully, but just on a sort of all, sort of all in uh, way, that you'll find Chinese money through it out of society. And as I said, that builds influence and allows you to do things like have countries switch recognition from Taiwan to uh, the PRC, and also to see the Chinese as the better bet, as the country that's more interested at the expense of the United States. So it is this presence uh, that, as they starts with commercial, goes to political, and in the process, it also brings in organized crime. Uh, and you also have, for many of these uh, projects that the Chinese bring in, they bring in their own laborers, their own workers. So you don't see the locals get any any advantage to it, uh, but also it further solidifies this Chinese presence in a given country. And if there's nothing to challenge that or that, well, you can kind of see the advantage that has. So this is really a non-military approach to establishing influence at the expense of the United States and sometimes its its allies uh, in the region. And the Chinese military presence in the Pacific region hasn't been all that big yet. But you'll see that many of their investments are in things like ports, airfields, et cetera, that have a dual use purpose. And when the time comes, you're going to see a Chinese military presence. It'll come in in dribs and drabs in small places, uh, but it's definitely coming. The Chinese can read the map as well as anyone. They are as smart military strategists as anyone. Uh, And they're willing, they're patient. They're willing to take their time uh, and get things set up for the, the time when it comes when you're going to see Chinese Navy ships showing up, uh, Chinese Marines getting off, etc. And it will be you know, just, uh, it'll happen almost by osmosis or so slowly that people may not even notice it. But that is is part of the equation. But they've not moved with that very much yet. I, I want to ask a question about that Chinese commercial influence. Now, I think it's, it's Obviously clear that like on a state level, when like major state owned Chinese companies are operating in these countries, that that is definitely at the directive of the central government in Beijing. But you mentioned it even goes down to like a street corner level. So how much of this is, you know, just individual Chinese businessmen deciding they want to go to some South Pacific island and do business? And how much of it is like directly at the bequest of, uh, of uh, Beijing? Well, it all feeds together. You know, the, all the Chinese communists have had to do is really turn loose the natural industriousness of the Chinese people and sort of t- turn, say, turn them loose. And oh, keep in mind that there have already been Chinese presence in most of these <clears throat> Pacific countries for a long time, but it's this, 
this newer wave that is the the difference and is um, really causing a lot of the con- local concerns. Uh, but the Chinese communists view things that individual Chinese do overseas as part of the, the so-called comprehensive national power. They look at it all as feeding into Chinese uh, power. So th- that's one way to look at it. It's not as if there's one office in Beijing that tells, you know, tells some guy, you go open a street corner shop on this corner in the Solomon Islands or in Vanuatu and send us 10% of your earnings. But re- rather say they just have to sort of turn them loose. And then you do have bigger countries, companies, however, that are uh, state connected or state owned and say one that's get ones that get into fishing and logging. These are very much uh, Chinese government companies. They may look like private uh, companies, but if you dig into it, uh, they're really not at all, not at that level. Uh, Partly to get the money to do what they do, they have to get government approval. If you have to pay in convertible currency, the Chinese government controls that. But at the individual street corner level, that is the Chinese communist just, I think, very wisely taking advantage of what I earlier called the natural industriousness of the Chinese people. But they do go out to the, the ends of the earth, quite literally, and work, try to make some money. I was going to say, I think I saw this when I was in South Africa a couple of years ago, uh, because there would be in Johannesburg, a lot of what they called the locals called China malls which are just these large kind of shopping malls with lots of vendors all from China. And they would just be doing a lot of import-export businesses. And I talked to some of the vendors themselves, and they're just kind of ordinary Chinese people. Maybe they've been here five years or 10 years, you know, trying to make a living, but they've established a presence in South Africa. And then I was flying from Cape Town to Johannesburg, and on the plane uh, next to me was this Chinese man who was working for a big auto Chinese auto manufacturer. And he was coming in because his company was now establishing, you know, a presence in South Africa that they hadn't had before. And he was telling me like, oh, yeah, we're building there's new Chinatowns now outside of the old Chinatowns uh, that had previously been in the area where a lot of new uh, like a different class of Chinese person was coming in, people from different uh, levels of society, bigger businesses, state-run businesses. And then when I was inside, I forget where I was, inside a, a building, like a university or something in South Africa, I saw a poster for a Chinese-South African joint business thing uh, that was sponsored by, uh, you know, part of the Chinese, was sponsored by the Chinese state. And they had a simultaneously Confucius Institute sponsored uh, Chinese uh, kind of forum going on at the same time. So it was just really interesting to see all of those different levels working together. And it's almost exactly what you're talking about, Grant. You know, if you had seen, say, speaking of South Africa, if you'd gone back 40 years, there was a Chinese community. Uh, they did business. They have small businesses mostly, uh, but they were not a political factor, and it was very small. But if you fast forward, now you have substantial numbers, substantial business presence, and that does translate into uh, political influence, and it does in the Pacific just as well. But back to Africa, uh, one anecdote that actually tells you a lot about the say, the industriousness of the Chinese, but also the problems it causes. Uh, this was a few years ago. There was some uh, fussing uh, over the Chinese activities, and it was one of the West African nations. And the, they quoted a, it was like a local minister, and he says, the Chinese are even selling plantains and those fried bananas. And what that meant was that you would have individual Chinese on the street selling these fried bananas. And this was the very lowest rung of the economic ladder in these countries. So you would normally see locals selling these things, making a little money uh, to stay alive. But here you have Chinese people doing it. And you can see that that's the to the very bottom rung of the, the ladder. Uh, one, you know, there's different ways to look at it. One is that they've got the sort of the initiative and they don't mind doing it. Uh, but the locals see it and, well, where, what rung on the ladder are we going to get on? 
Uh, but it, it does give you some sense of just how all-encompassing this Chinese economic or commercial uh, uh, onslaught is a uh, one way to describe it uh, is is, and it it does have um, say it has a, a certain advantage from the Chinese government's perspective. But look at it from the receiving end. Uh, so that but that anecdote is one that uh, it's it says a lot. Now you mentioned this is all encompassing, and earlier you had added a line about organized crime. How does Chinese organized crime play into this? Well, well they follow the follow the Chinese diaspora, uh, you know, provide services, you know, pros the big in prostitution, drugs, call it extortion, uh, settling debts as well. And we'll have people in the Chinese community make use of organized crime. Even for human trafficking. It, that's a big part of it as well. You know, they and everywhere they go, the organized crime follows, and once again with problems in the local communities. But also this, uh, well, whilst I've sort of praised the industriousness of this Chinese commercial activity, it invariably just brings along with it sort of corruption on a Chicago level, uh, or then some. But it's uh, or back in the old days, of course, in Chicago. Uh, but it's just immense corruption. You know, you. Or a businessman, if you want to make sure things go smoothly, you provide money to the local uh, parliamentarian, local congressman, uh, local official, and well, things go smoothly for you. You know, if you need uh, uh, someone to look the other way while you log another 10,000 acres of pristine forest, well, a little money will take care of that nicely. And then you see the forest manager riding around on the, the newest, most expensive Harley Davidson motorcycle. Uh, but that is part and parcel of Chinese overseas uh, commercial activity. And in some ways, it gives them an advantage. Uh, but at the same time, it uh, makes them very unpopular with a lot of people. Well, it does give them a big advantage because U.S. companies cannot do that. There are U.S. laws against it. And if you get caught, you're in big trouble. But Chinese companies are not restricted by the law. Yeah, you know, that's true. It's, you know, one tends to just we instinctively avoid making these sort of general statements. But yeah, it's pretty much true uh, that, you know, it's uh, the presumption should be that where Chinese business is, there's going to be corruption uh, with it. So we have a certain business model, which, you know, for U.S. businesses that do, do business a certain way, the other side has a very different model. And you wonder if ours is you know, it can compete with that. It's not saying that we become corrupt, but it does say you have to do something to take away that advantage which the other side has. And in that regard, it's not as if uh, local people, unless they are got their hands out, actually appreciate corruption. Uh, but if nobody's exposing it, well, what are you going to do? You know, it puts them, it uh, puts, the, they're in a, a very serious bind. And that's where we could provide a lot of help, I uh, say, by exposing the corruption that goes goes on, the the, sort of the shady aspects of these uh, larger investments uh, that Chinese companies make, and uh, we're spending eighty five billion dollars a year on intelligence uh, in the U S. alone, and we have some pretty good capabilities. We might deploy a little bit of it uh, to look at what is uh, coming along with Chinese investment in these overseas in these places, and the the people that don't like it and that are actually favorable towards us, they would appreciate the help. You know, they could use the help. Yeah, I guess it's a fundamentally different business model. Like in the in the United States, ideally the government answers to the people. The people want don't want American companies doing shady things in the Pacific or in other developing countries. And so the government puts regulations and restrictions on the private businesses because they're not the same thing. In China, it's totally different. The the, the big businesses are essentially an arm of the government acting for a political purpose to gain control and influence at all costs. So, yeah, it's, it's, you, you really see how it is the Communist Party weaponizing industry and commerce for political purposes. Yeah, you know, that has an effect on, say, U.S. military operations. Because if you have a country where the Chinese influence has developed to the point where they, that they're, more of them look towards China – they're less interested in seeing the Americans showing up. Uh, and it's just a natural sort of development. Uh, so the, it's not just a commercial business competition, but it does manifest itself in the, the military realm as well. And this uh, in the form of reduced potential access to U.S. forces, 
and also the, the, the sense that, well, maybe the Chinese are as much an ally as uh, the Americans are. Uh, so it, say it plays out in ways that one doesn't often think. Yeah, well, which that makes sense from what you were saying earlier, which right now there isn't much of a Chinese military presence, but very quickly it could become that. While the U.S. has been edged out, suddenly you have a big Chinese military presence all over the Pacific, and then what are you going to do? Do you think that there is some kind of, uh, like, we have some kind of idea that, well, the Chinese aren't really interested in establishing a military presence. You know, that's just not what they do. Uh, that kind of uh, conventional idea, where did that come from? And is that valid? Uh, it's not valid. Um, the But it has been the conventional thinking in large parts of the that's the defense commentariat in the foreign policy class that China doesn't have any interest in you know, sort of a military presence beyond their immediate territory. Uh, they just want to make money. They don't want to upset the status quo. Uh, that was that you'd hear that all the time. And anyone who suggested otherwise, you would you know, you'd best be ridiculed. Uh, and it's just not not true. But that is has been the thinking. Uh, very much uh, for a long time, where people are sort of getting out of that now. Uh, but that was the the way it, you know, that would say that was the popular thinking for a long time. That seems incredible to me because if you just listen to what the Chinese Communist Party actually says, they have the goal of becoming the the hegemon of Asia. So how can how can you not? How are people making this uh, assumption that oh no, they don't want to actually do what they're saying they're going to do? No, no, just they, they need to put the military, the Navy ships around all of Asia to protect the legitimate commercial interests of totally private Chinese companies. Is that what people were saying? I don't I don't think that was it. But but right. Grant, where did the idea come from? Well, that that's coming. I think eventually once the Chinese do put the military out, they're going to say yeah, people will say, well, that's what all big countries do when they have overseas interests. What do you expect? And then if someone points out, well, these are the Chinese communists for crying out loud, who want to you know, get us out of the region at best and destroy us at worst. And then it's, well, there's nothing we can do. Uh, it's that old Yes Minister episode pl replayed uh, again. But I think part of the reason for this uh, has been a certain condescension uh, that the Chinese could never be our equal. They could never be like the Americans. You know, We have this military presence around the world and we're the most powerful military bar none. We spend more than the next five or six countries combined put on uh, defense. So therefore, the Chinese just could never do this, which, as I say, it's a condescension. You know, and don't forget, these are the guys that built the, the left half of the transcontinental railway, which was the hard half through the mountains uh, with picks and dynamite. So but that has been, I think, no one will admit it, but I think there is a sort of a racial aspect to this, this idea, well, Chinese could never be like us. Um, also, once you have, you find in that commentary of class uh, that once you've staked a position, people rarely want to change it, that it, you, they will defend it at all costs. So now to suggest that the, you know, that the Chinese are, in fact, looking for a military presence and inroads into the region, as they have been saying, if you actually just read what they have said and, or read what they've written and listen to what they've said, uh, to say that would be embarrassing. And a lot of people don't uh, want to do that. So you know, it's human nature on display, I suppose. But you know, keep in mind that the Chinese, if they wanted, they could put out today, they could put together two what are called marine expeditionary units. And this is what the US Marines and the Navy have been doing for decades. That's three amphibious ships about 2,000 Marines with all their hardware and helicopters, and they sail around the region doing exercises, port calls, establishing a presence. And that, that has been the backbone, really, of the U.S. military presence in the region, that they float around or sail around from place to place. And the Chinese, if they want it, they have the, the hardware and the manpower and the expertise to send these out and show the flag and establish an alternative to the Americans. And these are particularly useful for things like uh, HADR, Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Relief. So when a hurricane or typhoon or flood smacks some country, you send out the MU, send out the amphibious force to save people's lives. 
Uh, and think of the, you get a lot of goodwill out of that. There's a political benefit to it. And you've established yourself as an alternative to the Americans. And as I say, the Chinese could put two of these together if they wanted, at least two. Uh, for some reason, they haven't wanted to. I'm not sure exactly why. They haven't told me. Uh, but they could do it. So that you know, we give a lot, pay a lot of attention to their commercial challenge. And from a military perspective, a lot of focus on Taiwan whether or not they could sink the U.S. Navy. Uh, but we're not paying enough attention onto these peacetime activities that establish influence. And that's where the, you know, the Chinese are oh, they're able to do it. And one of these days, they're going to be doing it. You're going to see this throughout the Pacific. And it probably won't be in the too far distant future. Well, so for somebody who would say, you know, what really is the difference between U.S., uh, Navy forces floating around in the Pacific versus Chinese forces doing humanitarian rescue stuff or the same thing. What really is the difference? Well, if you're on the receiving end, the immediate receiving end, probably not. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the Chinese are not the Canadians. The Canadians don't take hostages. You know, the Chinese do, like the old Barbary pirates. Uh, you know, this is a, a nasty regime. You know, there's no two ways around it. You know, if they open up the concentration camps and stop our harvesting organs, uh, then maybe there's a case to be made. But the fundamental nature of who it is sailing around uh, does matter, just as it has throughout history. You know, if it was, um, you know, the Spaniards sailing up to England, you know, what's the problem with that? They're just nice Spaniards. Um, or the, the Turks showing up in Venice. Well, they're just, you know, they, we like Turkish food. Uh, the nature of a regime does matter. And we tend to lose sight of that, particularly because some people think there's so much money to be made uh, from China. Well, I think a lot of the issues you're talking about really are elucidated in the island, in the Solomon Islands, which has been in the news a lot lately. Sort of the Western media has been latching on to this idea of these violent protests in the Solomon Islands. Uh, are they getting the story right? Are they getting the story wrong? I think they're getting it um, more wrong than right. You know, there's a, I mean, they kind of get the basics right, but it, as usual, the details are different. Uh, you know, one of the, the great ironies of all of this is that the troubles in the Solomons, um, you have a, a prime minister basically driven by resentment over Chinese influence. Uh, and that, say, is the driving force. It's, of course, overlaying a, a society that is ultimately based on family loyalties, village loyalties, tribal loyalties, etc. So that would be a challenge in its own right. But the, the spark for all of this is the, the Chinese influence in the sense that it's Chinese companies and Chinese who are uh, looting the country, uh, that they've paid off the, enough of the leadership uh, to have their way. And the Solomon people themselves are basically losing their own country but also seeing no benefit from it at all. And in those any kind of society, but particularly those, when you're not getting benefit from something and it looks like you're being treated unfairly and foreigners are doing it, uh, that's not a very good mix to have. But you, you have the, in this case, you have the protesters or the people who are unhappy with it, <clears throat> as has been reported. You know, it isn't, <clears throat> they had been uh, angry for a while, not surprisingly, but they showed up on the opening day of parliament and protested the, uh, the, the police and the, the government responded instead of with talks and coming out to you know, see what's going on, they sick the police on them with tear gas. Uh, that tends to provoke a reaction as well. But these were peaceful protests until uh, the authorities responded the way they did. But the thing is that to keep it, and this is one of these great ironies of foreign affairs is that the, the current gov prime minister of Solomon Islands is, is basically, you know, he's pretty corrupt. And he's widely believed to be on China's payroll, as are his henchmen, and he's used Chinese money to go after his opposition. Uh, and he's, you know, has a, a lot of the blame for what has happened. But so what happened is that when the rioting started, that he apparently was giving some thought to stepping down. Uh, then he apparently thought to ask the Australians if they would come help. So the Australians agreed to send troops, police, and diplomats over uh, to stabilize things so the political process could work itself out. So what you have is the, the Australians who are in a nasty fight with the Chinese. 
as we all know. Uh, now going in to back up the Chinese supported prime minister of the Solomon Islands uh, so that he can catch his breath now. And this is what he's going to do, catch his breath and then enlist hired thugs to go after the opposition. Uh, it's, uh, there, there's an irony there. One wonders why Robert Mugabe didn't give the Australians a call when he thought things were getting out of control. Maybe they would have obliged. Uh, but it's, it's say there's always an inconsistency in uh, foreign affairs, but you really saw it on display with what the Australians did uh, in the, the Solomon Islands. And they say, well, we just want to give the political process a chance. But that only works when both sides are playing the, playing this game, playing the process the same way. And if one side is going to use its coercive power, and that means, as I said, hiring thugs to go murder your opposition, uh, beat them up, uh, to arrest and detain indefinitely community leaders, religious people, uh, you know, intimidate the other side into submission, uh, that isn't quite the political process that most people have in mind. Uh, and that's, you know, so it puts, doesn't exactly put the Australian government on the side of the angels. Uh, and there have always been in these countries, there have been people, though, who, one, don't like the Chinese influence, uh, but are basically pro-West, pro-freedom, uh, just irritated by all this corruption, by the, the savaging of their countries by foreigners. And these are, are a potential constituency uh, for us to take, uh, for, for us to use to support, to actually promote our interests instead of standing back thinking that there's a nice... Marquise of Key, Queensbury rules, boxing match taking to, or debate taking place. And we'll just let that play out. And then public wishes will be uh, sort of manifest and, and that. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen any more in the, the Solomons than it did in Venezuela or in Turkey or any number of places. Uh, yeah, I think the Solomon Islands is, is really like the perfect example of what the Chinese Communist Party's playbook is, you know, the the. Uh, financial influence. Uh, a few years ago, Chinese influence helped uh, lead to the Solomon Islands rejecting uh, Taiwan as the diplomatic ally and switching over to recognizing the PRC. And yeah, in protests like this, like in the Solomon Islands, they call it the switch when they switch from Taiwan to the PRC. And that upset a lot of people. And they've been trying to protest against this. But, you know, the government's response is, as you said, higher thugs. And it really seems like this is a government bought off by the Chinese Communist Party, and they're oppressing the people. Uh, it is, and they, I think that is a fair enough statement. Uh, of course, they, you can argue the complexities forever, uh, but that, that is basically you know, what you're saying. And the right term playbook is the right way to look at it. Like if you get in with the commercial influence, you spread your money around, like the Russians have landed in Jersey, uh, and you just... It, uh, and you, you buy influence. And there's, um, you have people, though, in a lot of societies, and I'd say it's third world up to first world, who are glad to keep their mouth shut and their palm open. Uh, and it's not hard to, to buy influence. And then you, you get these commercial interests uh, that are spreading money around so they can have their way, uh, the organized crime aspect to it, the corruption. And pretty soon it has a demoralizing effect on an entire society but it also tends to make things even more unstable, uh, sort of uh, both more miserable and unstable at the same time. So you might think you're going into, you know, just restore order so the political process can work. But what you're doing, in fact, is just you're making things even worse. Uh, and one of the say the fortunate things is that there was, um, you know, with this whole Solomon's business. Uh, it does look as though the prime minister may have been forced to step down to uh, accede to the protesters' demand, but somebody came in and bought him some time, and now the New Zealanders have gotten in. Uh, there's New Guinea troops, apparently, that are coming in, and they are not particularly welcome in the Solomons. Uh, they've, um, you know, some might, you know, one wonders if they might be sort of uh, hitmen or the heavies for the Chinese logging interests. Uh, you, you, there's a you could write a book about what's going on uh, in the Solomons. The Fijians are coming, and they apparently are pretty uh, well regarded in the place. But the Americans, of course, they uh, it's a good thing that the U.S. Embassy has a, a handle on things uh, in the Solomons, or at least it would if there was an embassy there. There's no U.S. Embassy in the Solomon Islands? <laughs> no, it, uh, which 
you know, it's strategic territory. Of course, it's a smallish country, but it's right uh, in the middle of things. If you are interested in defending your interests, uh, particularly from a military perspective in the region. Uh, so we've we've effectively outsourced our foreign policy down there to the Australians. Well, I think that's that's an important point because I don't I think many people listening to this like, you know, why should Americans care about the Solomon Islands? Like there isn't even an embassy there. Well, let me just what why should Americans care? Why why are the Solomon Islands important to the United States? Well, the same reason they were in 1942. You know, you, you know the Japanese went down there, took the Solomon Islands and the Americans had to go take them back. Why did they have to? Because if you get out the map, and that's always a, you know, I have to do it all the time to go over the map of this region. There's nothing to be ashamed of uh, if you do, but the Solomons are sitting up to the north, to the east of New Guinea, to the north of Australia. From there, you can partially isolate the Australians from the rest of Asia. You can potentially uh, block their sea, the sea lanes, their lines of communications with the with the United States. Uh, that's useful in its own right. Plus, if you can get get yourself uh, inserted into the Solomons, from there you can influence throughout the region. You can establish a presence in other countries down there. So, what we're talking about here is, in some ways, it's uh, preventive care to keep a war from one to keep a war from starting, and if one should should. Uh, happen. You don't want to have to retake territory twice. Uh, And it's costly, you know, especially if uh, somebody, well, maybe it isn't if it's somebody else's kids who are doing the die. Uh, But that's, so there's a military reason for this political reason. Uh, And, and in the grand scheme of things, you have, we are, you know, in a conflict with the Chinese. They see it as a war. We don't see it as that yet. Uh, and the idea is to get us out of the region. If you can push us out of the Solomon Islands uh, and establish yourself down there, you've uh, sort of advanced your position on that chessboard uh, pretty nicely. As I say, it is strategic terrain down there. So the Americans, by their just simple absence, uh, it's, uh, it, it puts us at a disadvantage. It's an unfortunate thing. And you do wonder what people are thinking uh, at the, say, indo pacom headquarters in Hawaii or the Pentagon in Washington. Well, I was going to ask that because, like, people may know uh, the Solomon Islands from, uh, I'm going to mispronounce it, the Battle of Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. Something like that. Uh, yeah, major U.S. operation to, you know, take back that area from the Japanese. And yet, you know, the U.S. shed blood there. But after that, we don't even have an embassy? Like, what? what is that thought process? Well, it's, I, <laughs> if you figure it out, let me know. Uh, it's, you know, it is the sense that, well, we've got to prioritize, we only have limited resources, and we can have our good friends, the Australians, take care of the Solomons, we can have the New Zealanders take... They're criminals! <laughs> Chris, God. Some of them were jailers, so you have a mix of them. Ah, but, good point. <laughs> it's, uh, so it's a, you know, it's, they're not all criminals. So, you know, but, you know, make, make no mistake, the Australians are a good ally. And, but there's always a, a danger to outsourcing your foreign policy to somebody because you don't know how well they're going to do it, no matter how competent they seem. Their interests are not going to be the same as yours. Uh, and also by not being there, you, you're you relying on for information, for a sense of things, on what other people are telling you. And that's never ideal. Plus you ask ask the, uh, the, Solomon, the Solomon Islanders, well, what do you think of the Americans? Well, we really like them, but they're not here. Uh, and the dynamic is always going to be different. The Americans are regarded differently in the Pacific and in this part of the Pacific than are the Australians, than are the New Zealanders. Uh, so that's, but you know, if you're not the end, you're sending this message. If you're not there, you're not interested. Well, it's just also like, you know, you say we, we trusted the Australians to handle it. Well, what are the Australians doing? Even though they're in the middle of a horrible trade war with China, they're sending in troops to back the Chinese-backed prime minister. Well, do you think the Australians see it this way? Because I think, you know, Grant, have you seen this Financial Times report about the Solomons? It's called Economic Woes, Not China, are at the heart of Solomon Islands riots. And essentially it's saying, well, it's being, this whole thing in the Solomon Islands is being interpreted as some kind of proxy battle between the U.S. and China. But 
that's not really what's happening. Like the the root of the it, the the article says, like the root of what's happening is, you know, there is a lot of unemployed young people in the Solomons, and this is this is the expression of their economic frustration. It doesn't have anything to do with China, except for the you know fact that some of a lot of these business people are Chinese, so they're being they're kind of the victims. Like people are taking out their their uh, economic frustration. China's the victim in all of this. On, on the Chinese, you know, on the Chinese, uh, on the Chinatowns, right? And then it also quoted the prime minister as saying something like, oh, well, this, these these riots are being inflamed by foreign actors. Hostile it's, foreign forces. Yeah, yes, it is it is like, it's, but like this is in the Financial Times. Yeah, I, I saw the article. Um, the, the reporter uh, is, I think, based in Taiwan. But she needs to do her homework. Uh, in fact, if you when you went on and read the article, most of the problems were all the result of this Chinese presence. Uh, but what she did is it reminded you of these reports you would read, say, in uh, the seven, late 70s in Rhodesia, what became Zimbabwe. You'd have foreign reporters come in, talk to the same wrong people over and over, and think they had the country wired. But th this is a Unfortunately, they could because she's a very good reporter for things she knows about, but she didn't do her homework. You could probably use that article at Columbia Business Journalism School or wherever they teach this stuff, and uh, as how not to do foreign reporting uh, on this. But she completely got it wrong, uh, as, as I said. It's uh, so she talked to the wrong people, she mischaracterized things, she got her facts wrong, she left out a lot of things. And if you read that article, uh, you would be just you would have about as wrong an understanding of the situation in the Solomons as is possible to have. So is it possible Australia is reading this article? Well, the thing is, the Australians, you know, they know the situation. You know, they have a presence uh, in the Solomons and throughout the Pacific in places we don't. And they really do have a good understanding of what's going on. And then there's Australians and then there's Australians. Uh, you'll find it's ones who have a uh, tie in with the government will often see things a certain way. And then others on the ground, well, also on the ground, but without that connection, they will see it a very different way. And you have to get, you have to listen to both of them. And I don't think the other ones get listened to enough uh, in the Solomons, but the, the Australians do have, a, I think, a pretty good understanding of things. But for some reason, I, I think they're getting it a, a bit wrong in, in some of the, at least the official policy here. And it reminds me a little bit of what so I've used that Africa uh, example, but you, you used to hear, because I've, I've been chastised actually by one Australian friend that you know, I don't appreciate or understand the, the depth of what they're doing. And, and as I said, make no mistake, they are present. And there's a lot of effort that goes in from the Australians on the development front and Diplomatic front, etc. But he, but he sounded like you used to hear this a lot in with uh, in old in old South Africa what, during the apartheid era, or in Rhodesia uh, with the during the colonial era. You hear people say, "Ah, oh, man, we understand these Africans. We understand them. You can't understand them, possibly." And and our Africans love us. Now they love us out there, man. You hear this from the Australians and New Zealanders a lot. Well, they, the locals they love us. I did, you know, however the Australians would say it, you know, the locals love us. And, um, well, not all of them do. You know, they, there's, uh, you know, they may not quite understand that, you know, how they're regarded in a lot of places out there. Um, but it's, you know, it's the nature of things. But, but for understanding the Solomons, as I say, I'm not, I don't think enough of the right people have been consulted. And there have been Solomon Islanders who have really been begging over the last few years uh, to for the Americans in particular to get involved uh, to help, and the Trump administration it, it, for all the good things it did, it, it was just it didn't have enough time to really focus on it. Uh, but it's you know I look at the, what's going on in the Solomons, and I tend to see a lot of lost opportunities uh, here. But it's um, you know, we'll see how this plays out. Yeah, I know the Trump administration did make an effort to kind of reestablish connections to a lot of these Pacific Island nations. Like there was a lot of efforts in like the Marshall Islands, but uh, the Solomon Islands definitely was not uh, a focus of things. But this also makes me appreciate like the 
levels of strategy the Chinese Communist Party is using, because at the same time as, you know, they're buying off the Solomon Islands, they're also, you know, their their influence in Australia has been a huge topic. How much of this is all playing in together? Uh, you never know. It's a good question. And you know, there's, you know, I'm not devious enough really to understand it. But in a lot of these situations, you will find business interests uh, sort of whispering in people's ears, say, telling a government to take a certain step, take a certain measure, uh, because it's uh, going to restore stability. Uh, when in actual fact, there may be a concession that they think they're going to get you know, if a government does a certain thing, and you can probably read between the lines on what I'm saying, but I'm not going to say anything more than that. But but back to the Solomons, just to be uh, accurate, because it's otherwise we're going to be chastised by uh, Trump officials, uh, is that after the switch uh, in 2019, uh, the Trump administration did prevail upon USAID to allocate a $25 million of aid funds to the province in Solomons called Malaita, which is mm. the most anti-switch, anti-Chinese influence province there is. So the Americans did try to allocate a lot of money to that specific island, uh, a province, to uh, help them out. Uh, but I'm not sure how effective that actually was. And, and, and the Trump administration, well, of course, to how you actually spread the cash around is hard to... Uh, you know, that can be a little tricky because there is a central government involved here, and this is a, a pretty ruthless central government. So they're not going to probably weren't probably going to sit back and let the Malaitans become really rich and successful. In fact, there's say so, as I said, all of this overlays some island to island frictions that go back quite a ways, and Mal- Malaita versus other parts of the Solomons has been an issue for a long time. But the opposition to the switch to the Chinese influence, that is not just on that one in that one province. It's uh, you'll find it throughout the uh, throughout the Solomons. And and as as you mentioned, Chris, the Trump administration really did a good job in paying attention to the countries in the Central Pacific, inviting their their presidents to to visit the White House, having secretary of state stop by. And this was more than every administration before them has ever done. And they did un- They did uh, get involved in trying to preempt the Chinese from refurbishing an old naval base in, the, in New Guinea uh, as well. So they, did, they, they were the best there's been, as I say, in my lifetime when it comes to the, the Pacific. Uh, but they didn't have enough time to uh, really bring things to uh, conclusion or fruition in a lot of cases. But is, is that policy of uh, building up our alliances with these Pacific Island nations? Is that a policy that's being continued by the Biden administration and the new Secretary of State, Blinken? I don't think so. You know, they, uh, I'm sure they would take me to task for that, but, you know, I don't think so. Uh, what I would say is, well, where's that embassy on, in Honiara? Where's the plans for it? You know, what are, uh, you know, th- that's, that's just one thing. They can maybe be forgiven for that because they've got plenty of problems going on. But one specific thing that I would point to is in the Central Pacific, and you have to get out your maps, uh, there are what are called COFA states. This is the, it's like they've what they have agreed. The COFA is an agreement. These three nations, Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, they reached agreements in the 80s with the United States saying, look, America, in exchange for, for some aid, for the right for our people to live in America, we will give you so defense concessions, you have the right to control our, or to handle our defense. So you Americans can set up bases if you want, uh, and we will not let anyone else, and you can, we won't let anyone else have a defense presence here unless without your permission. So you have these agreements, uh, compact on free association. There it is. That's what the COFA is. And they, so these are written agreements. And part of the deal is that there's funding that comes with the COFA agreement. And the amounts are not huge, but it's really a payment to these nations for their willingness to be friends with us. And they use it for development, et cetera, et cetera. And the COFAs, the financial parts of the COFAs have to be renewed periodically. And the Americans are digging every, it's like squeezing blood out of a turnip to get the Americans to cough up the money. 
and the negotiations are they just drag on and they're kind of fiercely contested. Uh, and it the, the locals don't like it. And the Trump administration understood the importance of write, getting out the checkbook and writing that check and getting these agreements renewed. The new administration doesn't seem to see that that is important. And what are you going to do if you're, if you're on the other end? You know, what does that tell you about American interest in you? And, and they say the amounts of money are so tiny. Uh, if these guys were African drug lords or Afghan drug lords, you'd probably have C-17s full of cash on the way out in an hour uh, if they asked for the money. But our, the, these partners out in the Central Pacific can barely get the time of day from the administration. I mean, how much money do they want? Are we talking like billions? Or are we talking just like 20 million or what, what, what's our... We're, it's, it's like in the maybe 100 million or so. It's just, it's like 10 seconds of Medicare fraud. Uh, it's not much money. We're not talking these multiple billions that uh, you know, maybe what they should do is start developing nuclear weapons and then John Kerry will arrange for the Treasury to send them a few billion dollars on in pallets of cash. Uh, but it's, it's, not much, it's, say it's not much money. But you look at these islands, look at their location and think about what would you think if some other country was set up there? Uh, or their military was set up there, that you'd have some real problems. They're right in the heart of America's Pacific defenses. Uh, and they're well disposed towards us. They want us to be there. And, you know, but this administration isn't, as I say, it doesn't seem to consider it a priority, uh, certainly not above a, a national dental plan, it seems. But, but one on the bright side, it shows what can be done, is this island, the country of Palau, which is out to the, the west, it's east of Philippines, but in 2020, they invited the Americans to set up a military base in Palau. And when was the last time anyone invited us to send us set up a military base anywhere? Well, actually, four countries have over the last 10 years, and the American military has declined in each case. Uh, and that's in the Pacific. And that's just what I know. But Palau did it. They did it publicly. And you can imagine how popular that made them with the Chinese. And it took a lot of nerve for the president to do it. Uh, and I think that a lot of this, uh, you know, nobody, I don't quite know for sure, but I think a lot of this had to do with the good work of the American ambassador. There's an embassy in Palau. We have an ambassador, and it was, I think, a very good one. And I think it was a lot of his doing. You know, he would have, I had acquainted with him, and he, I think, would probably give a lot of other people the credit, but I think he deserves more than, uh, than he's willing to take. And it shows what can be done with the right people in the right places when you show some interest. Um, is, the, is the U.S. military moving out smartly on this offer? I don't get the impression they are, uh, but they should have moved out within 30 minutes of it being made. Uh, they just seem to take their time uh, doing things. If you, I don't know, built enough, a couple of Shangri-La hotels there that people could, um, could spend six weeks there planning things, I think you might get more interest. Uh, in these places. I'm being a little cynical on that, but it's a uh, key terrain. We've got people who want us there. We need to take more advantage of it. And that goes throughout the region. Uh, there's any number of excuses why we don't, um, but I've never heard a good one. But uh, that's just me. Do you think the U.S. military is just not considering that region a priority? Well, you know, there's people who know. <clears throat> and they... Have often, I, and I don't know what the reasons are, but they have an, often have a hard time of looking beyond the immediate priorities or the edges of the region. That's how I would recall, as I would describe it. Now, instead of looking at the whole map and saying, you know, we got to pay some attention everywhere, uh, they just, for some reason, <clears throat> don't seem able to do what needs done. And I say to have that permanent presence to establish themselves in the region, show the locals that they give two hoots. Uh, and as they set up a permanent presence, as it is, they do send boats and aircraft through and maybe do some exercises, but that's kind of like a cargo cult. Or like the Harlem Globetrotters who show up once a year and put on a great show and everyone has fun, but they don't get any better at basketball. And you know, nor does that prevent the you know some other basketball team coming up while you're gone. Uh, but I don't really know what the reason is. I'd say ultimately a lack of imagination. Uh, I would... You know, without being snide, I think if you uh, asked any number of captains and majors what we ought to be doing, they'd tell you and right away, 
And then if you said, okay, here's a credit card and go get the, and some plane tickets, go get things done, I think they'd probably get it right. Uh, I could say we have been offered things in the Pacific and the captains and the majors understood, even put together plans in, in some cases that would have worked out just right. And at the higher levels, this was just turned down for whatever reason. Oh, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. It would never pass the interagency process in Washington. You know, we need another six years to do the PowerPoint slide deck, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, there's any number of excuses why, but you know, they, making good PowerPoint is hard. Oh, it, I can't do it. But um, at the same time, the, the Chinese can. Or they don't even. <laughs> I don't even think they have PowerPoint. Um, there, but, there was a New York Times article about how the military uses too much PowerPoint. They really? Do, like. Yeah, about how how terrible all these PowerPoint meetings are. Yeah, but it is. But you know that said, it, and I'm being obviously a little you know tongue in cheek about it. But uh, for whatever reason, and this is, and I've been around long enough that this has been going on for decades. You know, they you know, we all we were active in the region. We do things. We engage. But then, you know, for example, the few years back, the Marines asked themselves, you know, we've done all these things for 50 years with our partners. Now, who could we do an actual real world opera amphibious operation with on short notice? Nobody. Uh, so nobody, we do a lot, but we don't keep score. But as, but back to the Pacific islands, you know, this is a place that, you know, you have to look beyond that first island chain and it helps to look farther to the east and sort of stiffen your defenses and everywhere because the Chinese are by their presence in the Solomons and throughout the region, Kiribati, Vanuatu, uh, just New Guinea, everywhere, they've, they understand the strategic geography and they're, over, they're leapfrogging the so-called first island chain that hems them in. And if you can get behind your opponent's defenses, well, he's got a problem. And you can erode them from behind. And you don't even have to do it by fighting. You do it commercially, politically, influencing, psychologically. And you're seeing that played out uh, throughout the region, and unfortunately, you're seeing it in the South America, the Caribbean, Africa, uh, just about everywhere. And we're standing here transfixed, like we're looking at a cobra, and can't decide if we want to move or not. Uh, but it's uh, we've gotten ourselves into a fix, and I presume that the good Lord will get us out of it somehow. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned sort of how China is leapfrogging the first island chain. Because, you know, this then brings us into the issue of Taiwan, which is a major thing we have to, you know, no, no discussion of security in the Pacific can really be complete without discussing Taiwan. Now, this does seem to be uh, how the U.S. is treating Taiwan does seem to have consistency between the Trump and Biden administration. It seems like there is more and more overt support for Taiwan. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think the, you know, I would, the Biden administration, I think, has done some things for Taiwan uh, that are, are good. And they have as I maintained, as you put it, maintained that Trump policy, um, that, you know, that insufferable Mr. Trump. But nonetheless, the Biden people they seem to think he was good enough in this regard. They've done things, most recently invited Taiwan to the democracy summit. You know, in its own right, this is like getting invited maybe to an Amway convention in, for what it produces, but in terms of the symbolism of it, uh, this is immense. It would have been very easy to say, nah, it's just too much trouble. We don't want to get the Chinese mad. And that's what most administrations would have been, would have said before the Trump administration. But the Biden team did this, and that's a good thing. They have treated the Taiwanese with more respect. Uh, they have allowed congressmen to go visit Taiwan, et cetera. They, they've talked uh, and they've, you know, have, as I said, used their sort of verbal weaponry on Taiwan's behalf. Uh, and they deserve credit for that. You know, the larger approach to, to China, that's uh, another issue. Uh, but every administration has been challenged by that. But what they have done for Taiwan is uh, actually um, a pretty good, uh, they've done some good things. You know, and as I say, they deserve credit for that. But then you do have uh, you know, their, their work cut out for them because you're probably going to have, for example, Honduras switch to the PRC maybe before this show is over. Uh, and what is the Trump? What is the Biden administration doing, sort of, on things like that? So you can invite somebody to a summit, but you've got to. There's a lot more that needs to be done to bolster Taiwan's position. 
Uh, I mean, you mentioned Honduras and that kind of raises an issue of like, you know, Honduras is not necessarily uh, good governance, let's say. Uh, and it seems like there's this difficulty of like, do I want to work with a government that is is problematic in a lot of ways, uh, but try to build that relationship enough that at least we can stop them from, you know, getting into bed completely with China, right? And like Nicaragua as well, which is still has relations with with Taiwan, but could also has been wooed by the CCP uh, and the Solomon Islands, right? It's like, well, uh, Australia is, you know, whoever's in power, they want to be there so they can have influence. And this is naturally the way that that Western governments tend to operate. And I'm not saying this to defend Australia. This is just more my perception of the political realities as these Western governments see it. It's like, well, uh, they can either be there and try to play ball with that local government, even if the government has a lot of problems, or they can withdraw. But the consequence of withdrawal is that who's going to come in, it's going to be China. And then that's going to create bigger problems. So, I mean, like, what do you do? You know, I would, it's, those are good points. And what, one thing that I, you know, gets my attention, I wish we'd do better at it, is that for some reason, the Americans don't do political warfare. Now, we tend to stand clear of domestic politics, or we think we do. But in all of these countries, we have constituencies that like us, that like what we stand for, uh, and they want our help. And even as say just a moral support sometimes helps, there's financial support you can provide uh, in certain ways, and and you've got to give them some effort. You know, you've um, you know, we have to defend, you have to help our friends in these places, and otherwise it's like watching two people fight. One of them's using brass knuckles, and the other isn't, and the brass knuckle guy is winning. But we're not going to help them because we're not going to step in. You know, we it's you know it's not our thing, not our place. But administrations like the Obama administration had no trouble interfering in, uh, say, Israeli elections because they hated Netanyahu so much, or interfering in the UK's Brexit vote. Uh, you know, which both were ill-advised. But you know, if you but there are ways that you can support our allies, support our friends in each of these countries. Uh, and that's uh, things that we ought to do. And you know, once again, we need to be more engaged from a government perspective. You know, once again, as we said, if you don't have a, an embassy there, how serious are you? Or if your embassy is two people, uh, but you know, also there's commercial support that you can provide. Uh, but you know, we so say we we don't. You know, we tend to stand clear with eyes primly averted, while some pretty thuggish people are allowed to run rep, run roughshod. Uh, over a, a society or a government. And once again, I would point to Venezuela as just a, a, a case in point uh, for this. Well, I think it's interesting that you say, um, you know, the U.S. doesn't really do political warfare because there is this perception, at least, that, you know, like the CIA is this super powerful organization and like undermining every country in the world. Whereas China, you know, they, they, they don't do anything like that. They have no larger ambitions. Uh, so it's interesting that this is the perception that is out there. If, well, if people only knew, they, uh, I think they uh, just how inept we are at political warfare. It's, um, I, I'm told that there are people on the U.S. government payroll, like GS jobs, who get paid to do this sort of thing. Uh, it's a well-kept secret what they actually do. Uh, but we don't do it. We used to know how to do it back in the Cold War. Uh, but th I mean, didn't a lot of that kind of go wrong in Central and South America? Like, are Americans trying to decide who should win the election? Well, there's a say so you have to do this the right way, and um, you know, or you know, I, or you'll have the this Guatemala Freddy Arbenz. See, I had to throw that out because I'm old enough to know the name. Uh, but also look at what we did against the Russians using um, uh, La Valesa. At the polls, the, the Pope, they did a pretty good job of bringing down the Soviet Union. Uh, so we kind of used to know how to do it. We also we were smart enough to find people who, who could do it and support them back then. It's not us taking the front uh, all the time. But if you do it right, but the first thing, if you're going to do it, you have to kind of understand how it works and have some commitment to do it, and then not don't do boneheaded things. 
<laughs> like uh, funding Osama bin Laden to fight the Soviets. Uh, <laughs> oopsie. Well, actually, they didn't, they didn't use bin Laden to fight the Soviets. Um, he was actually a nobody then. Uh, that whole idea that the CIA somehow created and funded bin Laden is mistaken. And I will say that with some uh, knowledge of it. As a, he was like a nobody. He and his Wahhabis, all they were very good at was chopping off the heads of female teachers. Uh, they were not very good fighters at all. The, there were other things that weren't done very well in that Charlie Wilson's war business, but the bin Laden thing wasn't one of them. But the, I know what you mean. But what I would say is, well, they look at all the opportunities they had to squander, that they to, to do get you know get rid of him or or Al Qaeda that they squandered in the 90s, uh, and then it leads up to. Uh, 9-11. And that's with, back to the Solomons. Now, we've had these opportunities over the last decade to, you know, to sort of help our, the, sort of the, the pro, our, our partners in, the, in that country, and we squandered them. And it tends to sort of brew up, and it explodes like it did the other day, whereas all this could have been worked out or you know, could have been avoided uh, if we had paid attention to it uh, in the right way before that. Do you think that we've just lost the knowledge of how to do this? Because, you know, all of us, are we're in our 30s. We grew up kind of in the, like, at the end of the Cold War. You know, we were in elementary school when the Soviet Union collapsed. So you, if a lot of people who are working in the U.S. government are our age or a decade older, we don't have any experience with this kind of Cold War political warfare. Do you think that is that we've lost the knowledge or do you think that ideologically, this is something that the U.S. government doesn't want to do? I, you know, the, the knowledge is there. It's not hard to understand. You know, this isn't like trying to figure out how to play the piano. Uh, it's, it's not complicated, and it has a lot of uh, relationships to things like marketing and public relations, public affairs, uh, which America sells at. Uh, so it's not that complicated, but I think that you're right. That's a good point, that you know, if you grew up after the Soviet Union fell, well, why would we need to do this sort of stuff? Because we are the, you know, America won. We're the biggest power now and nobody can challenge us. So I think it was thought not to be necessary. I think like you've pointed out. And, you know, when guys like me talk about it, it's almost, you know, it'd be like when I was young, some guy talking about the Spanish-American War. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I get it. <laughs> but the, uh, so it is, uh, there's a historical uh, challenge here. Uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, it's not that hard to figure out if we chose to do it. And there's a sense in the, say, the foreign policy class that, well, gentlemen don't do political warfare. You know, that's propaganda. That's lying. And it's none of the above. Um, but there is a, a sense that it's unseemly. And it also requires a little effort and some thought. And that tends to put off a certain type of uh, foreign service officer. Yeah, well, they won't appreciate hearing that. <laughs> I don't think they listen to this podcast, so you're safe. That's true. Well, I think the other side of uh, what what you're just saying, like besides the, uh, the idea that America won, uh, it's what, kind of what we were touching on, this perception warfare, where I think a lot of Americans do view, you know, the U.S. as, uh, uh, you know, the bad country, the one that is undermining other countries using the CIA and China, you know, whatever. And so that if there's no political will in the you know, the population of the United States, that's going to lead to a government that doesn't have any interest in that as well. Well, that's right. I think, you know, because, you know, people like me, at least, and I expect you all, you know, we sort of live and breathe foreign affairs. Most people don't. Really? <laughs> well, I, told, I reliably told that, but they, um, uh, but they, I'm also, it, there's a sense, and it's been around, you know, I can remember from you know my college days that America is the problem. America is the the bad country, and if we just do, you know, if we don't frighten people, if we don't do anything the people who hate America don't want us to do, everything will be okay. And they say that's been around a long time, uh, so it's still with us, and that is a challenge. You know, that too is another reason for our sort of handcuffing ourselves when it comes to sort of bolstering our defenses and propping up uh, people who want to be free. So what can we do? Well, maybe study a little history would be a, like quick history. And 
go back and figure out to when we used to do political warfare, you know, and, and give it a try. You know, find some, start teaching the thing, at, you know, start teaching it, say, at the Foreign, Foreign Service Institute, you know, make it a priority for us. And you really have to just go back to the 80s and, and you can get some pretty, pretty good idea of how we used to do this thing, uh, this very well. And once again, towards the Soviet Union. Uh, but also you've got to have some sense that what we have in the United States is worth, uh, is worth defending and it's worth uh, defending around the world as well. Uh, but that's just the political warfare end of it. Uh, and you know, there's also a military component, economic, financial, etc., and you've got to get all of these things to firing at the same time. Well, I think that basically wraps it up for today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Grant. That was, well, I mean, other than the advice that we have to learn from history, <laughs> uh, like I don't, I don't think people are really going to do that. Crack open a book. Well, what if there were videos about history that people could watch? Are you making a plug for our soon-to-be history channel? Yes. <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks, Shelley. <laughs> uh, all right, so we found the answer. We we will take. Don't worry, Grant. <laughs> We've got. We this. we're gonna take care of it. <laughs> we'll save the world. Three people on YouTube. I I will not rest well. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's always a pleasure to have you on, Grant. Grant, thanks thanks for being here. Okay. Okay. Well, I was glad to be here, and um, I hope assume I offended most of your listeners. Uh, but uh, no, I just sort of let it rip and um, you know, try to offer some ideas. Um, and at, at this time of day, I have sort of um, haven't burned off enough of my resentments, but now I have. So I'll be cheerful from now on. Oh, good. I'm glad we can, we're, we're helping people become joyful. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Great. We'll talk to you again. Yeah, thanks a lot. I uh, appreciate it. Okay. So I was a little distracted in the beginning when you said that uh, China wanted to be the global hegemon of Asia. Yes, that makes sense. How can you be the global hegemon of Asia? It's, uh, what what I was saying was in the in the whole world uh -huh. of the countries that will be the hegemon of Asia, China will be that one. Okay. Therefore, China is the global hegemon of Asia. Keep up, Shelley. <laughs> There's always a justification. Accuracy always. ninja has been blocked. <laughs> <laughs> With more accuracy. Hyper accuracy. Well, that was that was a very interesting discussion. Um yeah, you really see just what a complicated game the Chinese Communist Party is playing in terms of influence operations around the world with a very cohesive global strategy. And the U.S. is just not there. I don't know there. if it's cohesive so much as it's kind of like what Grant was saying about betting on all the horses. Well, I think there is a, like there is a general clear goal, which is to be the global hegemon of Asia <laughs> and to kick out U.S. influence. Yeah, but they're doing it in a – it's kind of like throwing everything on the wall and seeing what sticks, right? Mm. But, you know, unfortunately, they're – as – most people in the world live in authoritarian countries. There is a lot of countries that are willing to play ball with the Chinese Communist Party. Right. And and does that mean that we have to play ball with those authoritarian countries to at least, uh, you know, protect uh, them and ourselves against the Communist Party's interests? Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's not even an issue of like, oh, the U.S. has to work with dictators to counter China. There's just a million things the U.S. could be doing. Right. I mean, let's not. start off by working with other liberal yeah. democracies. Well, let's have an, an, you know. an embassy in the Solomon I, I, Islands. I was thinking about this because, you know, that the, the U.S., like, what was our like like financial crisis bailout in 2008? It was something on the neighborhood of like, what, $700 billion or something, right? No bureaucracy, no PowerPoint slides, just like. Here's the you money. Know, here's the money, and it all goes to banks, right? <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, w what these countries need, it's like like a hundred million dollars each to a, a year, let's say, to ten countries is a billion dollars a year, right? That's that's going to last us five hundred years, you know? Like like it's it's so little money to do so much to have these friends, and to, if we could get more countries under the the COFA agreement, the compact on free association, where like 
we get a base. And well, I mean, although Palau offered us a base and we're apparently not taking them up on it. Yeah. Well, I mean, who knows? Because the, the next administration there might decide, well, if the U.S. doesn't want a base, maybe we'll ask someone else. And that someone else is inevitably going to be, you know, China. So I don't, I don't think that's going to happen with Palau. But, well, well, maybe you know. not Palau, but like that's the pattern. So, yeah, I, mean, I think we're all in agreement here. I'm just I'm just a little upset about how money gets allocated in this country. I don't agree to that. What? I just wanted to be contrary. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I think Grant made a good point that it is like an issue of like, you know, Americans care about their dental plan. They like giving a hundred million dollars to a country, they've to an island they've never heard of. It's a hard sell. Well, I mean, I think most people don't actually know how much money the U.S. spends around the world, like with U.S. you know the that, aid programs. And that's whatever. definitely true, but yeah, it is an issue of like you know people don't understand how important a place like the Solomon Islands is to the U.S. It's easier to focus on like, oh, well, like, I don't want to pay for dental, right? Well, I mean, all, 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 it's, all politics is domestic, right? So in when we people run for president, they're always talking about things, domestic policy, even though what the president really has power over is foreign policy. You make an interesting point. All politics is domestic. So even if somebody wanted to be the hegemon of Asia, it's it's, it's the global what? affair. What? I, I don't I, I, at all what you're saying. I feel like that I, just, I lost you that just lost it at the end. All right, I, I should have switched it around. So even if somebody wants to be a global hegemon, everything is local, so it begins in Asia. Global hegemon of Asia. Yeah, that's, that, I guess, that marginally better. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense. But you know what, Chris? I'm going to defer to you on this one. Well, thank you. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> Let's just end the podcast, guys. I think we're on to something. This is a fruitful mine of ideas. Yeah, we're on to something. <laughs> Maybe let's make a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, that's, I think let's do that. Yeah. That's a solution. You know, Matt, you're good at PowerPoint presentations. Maybe you should start uh, teaching this stuff to... The U.S. military? I don't... The I think military. I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> hey, you can't spell the U.S. without us. There we go. Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Talk to you next time.